Our speaker tonight, Kim Klein, serves as the Acting Associate Administrator of the Bureau of Clinician Recruitment and Services, or BCRS, and the Health Resource and Service Administration, or HRSA, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. BCRS's single largest program responsibility is the National Health Service Corps, which has a budget of over $305 million for 2014 and a field strength of nearly 8,900 clinicians working in more than 5,100 NHSC-approved sites. Um, Klein serves as the acting director of the NHSC. The Bureau is also responsible for administering the Nurse Corps Scholarship and Loan Repayment Programs, the Faculty Loan Repayment Program, the State Loan Repayment Program, and the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program. Prior to her role as Acting Associate Administrator of BCRS, Kim served as the Deputy Associate Administrator of BCRS and prior to that as Director of the Office of External Affairs for the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, where she was responsible for strategic communications and implementation of large-scale public awareness initiatives for the programs administered by the agency. Um, Kim, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Uh, from here, I will hand things over to you. Great. Thanks, Christy. And uh, good evening and good afternoon to all of those uh, who are joining us on the East Coast and the Midwest and the West Coast. I'm really delighted to be with the Student doc Doctor Network tonight to give this presentation about the National Health Service Corps and to kind of give you guys a, a, a glimpse into uh, the programs that I help to run here in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So what if I told you that we had, tonight you were going to learn about uh, three uh, distinct but kind of similar loan repayment or scholarship programs that might help you, uh, you know, pay off your, uh, your debt to either school or in becoming a primary care provider. And we're talking about MDs and DOs and we're talking about primary care. And what if I told you that you uh, you would, if you in, entered, engaged in this program, be joining over 45,000 others who have, uh, throughout the 40 plus year history of the program, have gone and, and done this and have found really rewarding schools. Um, that's what I'm here to talk about and the program is a national program. It is run out of the government and it's called the National Health Service Corps program and it's got a pretty cool history and I'll get into a little bit of that as well. So really my agenda here is to get you familiar with the program, um, to talk about some of the little nuances because there's three distinct uh, pieces to this that I want to get into and um, then uh, get into a, a Q&A dialogue and try to answer as many questions as I can. So thanks again and uh, I'm going to be rolling on with my slides. So what is the National Health Service Corps? Have you ever heard about it? Um, it, it is a, um, a, a substantial program that we run here that essentially is designed to give scholarship and repay educational loans for primary care providers who in exchange for the, those, those funds say, I'm going to sign up and work in a healthcare shortage area known as a HIPSA. And I'll get into a little bit more about what a HIPSA is. But the real goal is we've got communities, both urban and rural and frontier in the country that don't have access to some primary care providers or limited access to primary care providers. So from my perspective, I see this as a win-win because it helps all of those of you who might be in debt and interested in paying back their educational debt uh, provide service to communities across our country and our territories who need it the most. And that's really what this, the, the program is in, in its simplest terms. Um, right now, uh, uh, across the, the country, we have almost 9,000 primary care health professionals serving at a, a little over 5,000 sites. And again, that's across the country in the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, in the, the uh, Virgin Islands, in Alaska, and every, almost all 50 states in, in the country. And that's what we look like today. Um, a little bit about how the program's operated. We are part of uh, the bigger agency, the parent company, if you will, is called the D U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
And within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, I'm sure you guys have heard about the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and we are HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration. And we are about a $8 billion agency, and we run uh, several different programs, including community health programs, and the one that I'm running is the National Service Corps and some other loan repayment programs like the Nurse Corps Loan Repayment Program. So that's who we are and that's how the program is run at a national perspective just to uh, give, give you um, a, a sense of where this is coming from. And you're going to hear me, I'm, this slide is introducing you to a health professional shortage area. You're going to hear me reference HIPSAs and HIPSA scores because this is really a designation that is determined by the Secretary of the Department of Health um, and it's a determination of a health workforce shortage or provider shortage. It allows us who, is, who are administering the program to see areas across the country where there are shortages. And there's three types of designations, a primary care HIPSA score, a dental HIPSA score, and a mental health HIPSA score. And for purposes of today's conversation, we're just talking about primary care because we're engaged with MD, MDs and DOs, so I won't really get into the dental or mental health HIPSA designations. But basically, if you were to engage in the National Health Service Corps and become part of our, our vast network, you would essentially be working in a primary care HIPSA and they're scored everywhere uh, on up from uh, 26 down to a zero. The higher the HIPSA score shows us the higher the need in the community. So I, I hope that the, the most simple way of explaining it, these slides are here as a reference. I don't want to get uh, too complicated, but I do want you to know what a health professional shortage area is and the significance to the National Health Service score. Um, the really cool history. This program has been around for uh, since the 50s and um, uh, for more than 40 years, and it was really created in response to a healthcare crisis that emerged in the country, where you had a lot of physicians who were retiring and um, rural areas and urban areas, and they left part of the country without medical services. So you had a bunch of rural sites appeal to Congress and say, oh my gosh, we are kind of getting in, in a critical need here for these primary care providers. Can you help us uh, fix the problem? And thus the program was designed and the National Health Service Corps was um, originally stood up. Um, coincidentally, uh, there has been um, uh, a movie made out of the National Service Corps. Michael J. Fox was the actor that starred in this. Oh gosh, I want it, It's an. I'm going to outdate myself because the movie was probably in the 70s or 80s. But um, he was a primary care provider working in a rural part of the country. So Michael J. Fox started a movie, and then there used to be a TV sitcom called Northern Exposure that was also based off of the National Service Corps program. Um, if you take a step back and you say, well, who are these guys? What does the National Health Service Corps field strength? I told you there was almost 9,000 providers across the country. What does it look like? Who are they? What are they comprised of? You've got um, a, a fair share, of, of even split uh, right now today, of 20% of us are physicians. 27% are mental health providers, and then uh, you've got uh, nurse practitioners are about 16%, comprise 16% of the field strength right now, um, physician assistants and dentists behind that, and then uh, on a much smaller scale, you have nurse midwives and dental hygienists, both representing about 2% of what we call our field strength, which are our, our providers who are actively serving and uh, providing uh, care. Just a couple of um, interesting facts. Um, uh, we, our membership right now is is caring for more than 9.3 million uh, people in the United States. Um, we have networking and educational resources available to help support our providers during their service, what we call service obligations. And the number of providers in this program has more than doubled since 2008. Um, the current uh, president and administration has given us a substantial amount of funds, so we were able to grow from about 3,500 providers in 2008 to almost 9,000 where we are today because of that money. Um, 
There are a couple of different uh, programs under the National Health Service Corps umbrella and the first one that I wanted to talk about is one of our largest programs and it is called the Loan Repayment Program. So what does a loan repayment program look like and, and, and what is it? Um, this program is for uh, providers who are already licensed and already practicing. You're not a student, you're licensed and practicing but you do have educational debt and we say if you apply to our program and you qualify and you meet our eligibility requirements and you become an awardee you can get up to fifty thousand dollars of educational loan repayment in exchange for two years of service um, and it's tax-free loan repayment and if you sign up and you serve your two years and you say oh I still have educational debt to pay off I love the site that I'm working in I love the community I really feel akin to staying here you can come back to us and say hey I'm still got educational debt that I need to pay off and we say great we want to keep you at that site and we want your continued service you're part of our team and family and you can come in uh, every year thereafter in what we call a continuation contract until you pay off your educational debt. In a nutshell, um, we offer two levels of funding and this goes back to the very first or second slide that I hit called uh, HIPSA or Health Professional Shortage Area. Um, we look at the need of the community and remember I said HIPSA scores are, are starting at 26 and they go down to zero and the higher the score the higher the need of the community and we say uh, for anybody who is going to work at a National Health Service course site in a HIPSA or a shortage area of 14 or higher for two years of service we're going to pay you up to fifty thousand dollars if you work in a site that has a HIPSA score of 13 or below we have a, a finan financial incentive of up to thirty thousand dollars so right now what we're doing is we're giving a, a financial incentive to those who work in the higher need HIPSAs because they uh, uh, trigger uh, communities in higher need to us what I what is also unique about this program is that you can full, fulfill your service obligation in a full-time capacity or you can fulfill it in a half-time capacity and it's a matter of clinical hours served so if let's say uh, you are out there and you're a licensed practicing um, MD or DO and you are in a National Service course site in a high HIPSA score and let's say you want to start a family or let's say you have to take care of an elderly parent and you can only commit to half time hours we do have that flexibility in that you can fulfill your service obligation by working half time and you'll see the difference in terms of what is paid out over that period so if you're saying if I I've wet your whistle and you're saying okay I'm interested and I'm curious and uh, how do I apply and, and how hard is it to apply this is uh, the, the um, these are the requirements every year we produce a application and a program guidance the program guidance is you know probably between 30 and 38 pages long but it spells out in excruciating detail whatever it is that you need to know about the program and it's important to read because there are nuances in there that you need to know before you make a commitment like this so if you're interested I would say you can go to our website and take a look at the program guidance and uh, and, and, and the application we open up uh, for several weeks during the year and um, this year our loan repayment program is already closed so we aren't accepting applications but the next program that I'm going to talk about which is our scholarship program is is open and accepting scholarship applications and every year we open them uh, around different dates but they're open for several weeks and you can go to the website and even sign up and say all right great notify me then when you're going to open up for um, the FY15 uh, fiscal year so you would review the guidance and the application you would then find a job at a National Health Service Co National Health Service Corps approved site or you can find out if you're working currently at a site if the current site is already a National Service Corps approved site by going to that uh, that that link below nhscjobs.hrsa.gov 
we have a job center that is a lot like, um, I guess, uh, a, um, uh, um, uh, trying to think of the, um, of the, of the, of, uh, not match.com. It's like a, it's like a match.com, if you will. It, it allows you to take a look at sites across the country, um, uh, and it allows you to look at HIPSA scores. So let's say you're a um, OBGYN and you want to work in uh, New Orleans and you're very interested in working in a site of 14 or above, you can go to the site and you can play around with it and it allows you to say, oh, I want to work in a HIPSA of 25, oh, I want to work in a HIPSA of 14, and take a look at what New Orleans has to offer in terms of sites there and it allows you to take a look at the sites that are hiring um, MDs or DOs. Um, so that would be our job center site and the place that we would direct you to to either find a job at a National Service Corps site or to see if your current site is already there with a profile. Step three would be apply online and that's the link to uh, apply online uh, at nhsc.hrsa.gov slash loan repayment and you can get there very easily by going to nhsc.hrsa.gov and you'll find uh, the loan repayment program right there. So three easy steps. Uh, the second one involves a little bit of, of, of searching to figure out if your site is an approved site and if not uh, where there are approved sites that are, are recruiting MDs and DOs. Um, I, I talked for a second about the job center and it, again it's an online uh, recruitment tool for sites and an online uh, search tool for our providers and our sites populate profiles and they like to showcase themselves and they tell you about who they are they tell you about the communities that they serve they oftentimes give you the hours of operation they they try to tell you why they're special and a little bit about the community and some of the languages that are spoken and they also uh, um, they also provide photos and and the fun things that the site is engaged in at a community level and it also allows you to see what they're recruiting for. So you could very easily do a search on the job center across the country for all um, National Service Corps sites that are recruiting uh, uh, physicians right now, primary care physicians. And in addition, we also have a Google-based map there that allows you to say, oh, well, what kind of schools are in the area? And what about restaurants? And uh, you know, what about housing? And so it allows you to look for the community amenities that are nearby the site so you get a feel for what the community has to offer um, before you even get there. And again, I, um, a couple of benefits that, that uh, are, are in the loan repayment guidance, but some of the service obligation can be fulfilled by teaching. And uh, we've got a lot of virtual networking opportunities that uh, we engage here um, that give support from providers across the country, face-to-face um, -face and virtual networking opportunities that we, uh, we uh, lead here as an agency. And what we've heard unanimously from our providers that have been in the program is, A, we had no idea we were part of something so big and so special and B, we have, are, have such an amazing and rewarding patient relationships and are really able to not only make a difference providing care, but we become those community leaders um, and in, in lots of ways. Um, we are the town doc and people know us and they seek us out and we're able to do pretty incredible things from the creation of a diabetes program to uh, doing screenings and mammography screenings and just doing all these unique things depending on the community needs. So it's not only rewarding patient relationships but really becoming a community leader and uh, well known where you're working. So how, uh, what, are, what are our eligibility requirements for the loan repayment program? You have to be a U.S. citizen, you have to currently work um, or apply to work at one of those National Service Corps sites and remember I told you, you can find them on the job center um, uh, in, in that recruitment tool and you have to have unpaid loans, government or commercial loans um, and uh, uh, have to have uh, have to have proof that those loans are indeed um, uh, loans for that, that that you acquired for school uh, tuition or educational expenses. You have to be as a loan repair. You have to be licensed to practice in the state where your employer is located, 
and you'll see the approved residencies here, uh, family medicine, internal med, general peds, OBGYN, um, psychiatry, geriatrics. Um, so you can, and all of this is in the application guidance and it's also on the website. So if you have any question about um, uh, about uh, the uh, disciplines and specialties, they're all there in that document that I told you about. Um, and th those are our chief eligibility requirements to, to be a loan repayer. So I know I've probably spurred some questions and I'm going to move from the loan repayment program again where you are licensed and practicing and already graduated but you do have educational debt and I'm moving to the National Health Service Corps Scholarship Program which is a different program and uh, this program is uh, award scholarships to students who are pursuing primary care um, health professions training that leads to a degree in medicine so either allopathic or osteopathic a degree in dentistry or a degree as a nurse, nurse midwife, physician assistant, nurse practitioner. Um, and so that is the scholarship program. In return for the scholarship money that we provide uh, our applicants, uh, the, the National Service Corps pays for their tuition and education related expenses. And we also give our scholars a monthly living stipend um, in, for, for their expenses. We do that in exchange for a minimum of two years of full-time service at a National Service Corps approved site once you graduate, once you get you through your residency, and once you're licensed and practicing. So the scholarship, the loan repayment program is you're already graduated and you're licensed. The scholarship program is you are a student pursuing a primary care health professions uh, uh, training. and for student doctor network we're obviously talking about primary care physicians. The scholarship program is currently open and it's accepting applications. Um, I think we close on May 20th at 7.30 in the evening so there's still time for anybody who's out there who resonates with this program to apply and um, this is what I reviewed with you just recently. The scholarship includes the tuition for payment and fees, which is tax-free, some other uh, tax-free costs, including books, and then a monthly living stipend, which is taxable. And I think that living stipend changes uh, every year, but I think this year we pay about thirteen hundred dollars uh, a month. And then uh, this is uh, Kristen Frank, and she's uh, one of our National Service Corps scholars. And I just thought this quote to be. Um, really apropos to the kind of scholars we see in our program. She says, we bring health care to people who otherwise wouldn't have access. That's what inspired me. It's filling a void. It's filling a need that is very much there. In fact, if you go on to our website um, on nhsc.gov um, or nhsc.hrsa.gov, you'll be able to pull up member stories, not only of our sites who talk about what it's like to work in an NHSC site, but also um, our, our, of our scholars and our providers, and you'll get to see uh, the, the people uh, that are, are part of our team. Um, let me just go through. Our, our scholars can't, you can come in in your first year of school and get four years of, of your uh, education paid for in exchange for four years of service. You could come in for one year of support, but you have to serve a minimum of two years. So the, they commit to serve, you, the, our scholars commit to serve in the Corps after they complete their training, one year for each year of support, but it starts out with a minimum at least two years. You have to commit to two years. Whether you take one year of money um, or two years of money, you're still going to be working to, for, for two years of a service obligation. Um, scholars do choose where they serve um, from a list of sites um, and those sites are on our job center and they grow every year. In addition to you getting a, a choice of where you serve, you want to be in rural or you want to be in urban um, or you maybe you want to go back to where you um, sought your tra educational training or whether you had your, where you had your residence, 
we have a, a team of about 60 of our staff in the regions across the country. There's 10 regional offices, and they serve as a counselor for you, um, really to sort of guide you in your decision making and to help you get interviews at the sites and to help you make that transition from your your education and school into a service commitment. So um, you're not all of a sudden graduating from school and saying well, what, what what am I supposed to do now we really our counselors will you know guide you like a placement counselor would and really take um, your needs and considerations in, in, into account as they're working with you to get you into um, sites uh, where you're needed and Really, again, um, once you graduate and once you pass uh, your exams and once you uh, do um, your residency and you're ready to be licensed and practicing and you're ready to serve, um, you, uh, very much like the loan repayment program, a part of your service obligation can be fulfilled by teaching. We also provide that face-to-face -face virtual networking opportunities with sites and support from other providers. You become part of our family and a very connected community that has is very mission driven in its purpose and uh, you know again I, I share with you that our providers have count, countlessly told us that wow I've never felt uh, like part of something so incredibly special and so uh, big and uh, they feel they get connected in that way um, the eligibility is very similar to the loan repayment program with the exception that we have a little bit uh, fewer disciplines uh, that, that we support. Um, it's a U.S. citizen, full-time student at an accredited school and you have to be pursuing a degree in medicine, um, MDDO, dentistry, nurse practitioner, certified nurse midwife and physician assistant. And then how to apply, very similar to the loan repayment program, we would ask you to please read the application um, guidance. That program guidance changes every year um, depending on a, our funding levels and depending on some of our policies. Um, they do change, so it's important that you are familiar with the guidance um, before you apply. Um, to apply online at nhsc.hrsa.gov and, um, oops, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, uh, the application guidance will give you specifics on when the, uh, when the scholarship program opens, when it closes, what you need to prove in terms of uh, the, your educational loans or what you need to prove from the school. So it lays out in, again, excruciating detail all the things that you need to, to, to know in order to apply um, successfully to the program. And it also talks about, you know, your service obligation and what that might look like and allows you to decide, um, you know, again, what you want to apply for in, in the program. Do you want to apply for one year of financial support or four years? And it really allows you to make that decision with a lot of information. The third program, I'm moving again, we talked about the loan repayment program, we then talked about the scholarship program, and I'm now moving into the final program that I want to share with you tonight in the National Service Corps, and that is the Student to Service Loan Repayment Program. Um, it's a little bit of a hybrid between the scholarship and the loan repayment program. This is intended for medical students in their last year of school. And this provides loan repayment assistance in return for working in an underserved community uh, or HIPSA of greatest need after you complete um, your residency and get licensed. So again, this program, where the scholarship program is, you're in your, you know, you could be in your first year of school or uh, your second year of school. The student to service loan repayment program is for medical students in their last year of school. Uh, with the goal of, of getting a, a residency, a primary care medical residency. For this program, um, the scholarship program pays all of your educational costs, including a living stipend and for books. The loan repayment program, if you will recall, pays up to $50,000 if you're in the higher HIPSAs. But the student to service program gives you $120,000 in tax-free loan repayment for three years of full-time service or six years of half-time service. And again, the loan repayment begins during your residency. Um, you can come out of this, uh, the, the first, uh, the first uh, I think it's, in, it's paid in uh, four installments, so you'll you'd get your $30,000 um, 
after you match to a residency that would be paid out in the first year and then you get thirty thousand uh, dollars thereafter until you reach 120 so again it's up to hundred twenty thousand dollars for three years of full-time service um, up to 120 if you want to go the part-time route for six years and have that flexibility um, and again once you uh, finish your residency um, and you're ready uh, to serve and you're licensed and ready to practice um, you would give us again if you chose the full-time three years um, if you chose the part-time six years very similar eligibility requirements US citizen you have to be a full-time student in the last year at an accredited school getting a degree in medicine, um, you have to uh, you have to complete an accredited primary care medical residency in one of our approved specialties, and the approved specialties are listed there below: internal med, family practice, peds, OB/GYN, um, psychiatry, and geriatrics. And then you must have unpaid government or commercial loans for in for your educational costs. Um, our documents, the guidance documents, do get into more detail on what constitutes a loan. So I, 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 people often ask us, what do you mean by government or commercial loans? And those documents really get, get into that, that detail. We also have technical assistance webinars for our applicants where they're able to call in and ask questions. Um, and we also have a call center where you're able to ask questions if you had any concerns about whether your loan would qualify. Um, there's ample uh, resources to, uh, to, to help explain those kinds of loans. Um, the, again, uh, the, the benefits uh, echo the others uh, for the scholarship and loan repayment program and um, this would tell you how to apply. I'm probably sound like a broken record right now but you want to look at the program guidance. It changes every year and it's important for you to be familiar with that you will want to apply online at that web address if you just go nhsc.hrsa.gov um, you can look up loan repayment program you can look up scholarship program and you can look up this program student to service um, and uh, you uh, oh um, I'm sorry and then if you want to again uh, uh, take a look at NHSC sites across the country um, you can go to uh, this uh, website and they'll explain a little bit more about uh, what's a National Service Corps site and how do they fit into the picture. One of the things that I neglected to tell you guys is that the site is your employer and they pay a salary. So, when, so it's really like a three-legged stool. It's you as the provider providing the service, the National Service Corps supporting you by repaying your educational loans or by providing your scholarship and the site, the approved National Service Corps site, is paying your salary. So you would have a contract with the National Service Corps on your paying your loans and you probably will have a contract with the National Service Corps site as they would be your employer um, of, of record and be paying your salary and benefits. And then um, Again, these sites allow our providers to fill their service obligations. They're all over the country. They are as rural as you want to be and um, uh, as urban as you want to be and um, all over the country. Right, right now, I, 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 uh, we use the number of 5,100 sites. Those are just the sites that have active providers in them. We have a portfolio of over, over, over 14,000 National Service Corps sites across the country, so don't get fooled by the 5100 number that's just the number of uh, that that have active participants right now but uh, 14,000 is a lot for a site uh, they have to be located in this HIPSA remember we talked about that earlier in the discussion and they have to see all patients regardless of their ability to pay and they have to provide services on a discount fee schedule um, and uh, we have uh, we have our regional teams that help place our scholars also helping our sites make sure that that they uh, maintain their eligibility and they fulfill their requirements um, one thing I wanted to invite you to is that tomorrow evening uh, for if I if again I, I hope I've inspired some of you to take a deeper dive into the National Service Corps and look further into the programs whether it's loan repayment scholarship or student to service but tomorrow night we're going to have a Facebook chat and it is learning about the National Service Corps from the eyes and ears of, of those providing service. 
and getting your questions answered by National Health Service Corps providers themselves. Um, it's a live uh, chat on Facebook tomorrow, Wednesday, April 23rd from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And right below that graphic uh, right here, you can see the link at www.facebook.com slash National, National Health Service Corps, uh, Service Corps. And you can click there and uh, become part of the chat. So I encourage you to do that if you've got any interest and in, you want to hear from providers across the country who are actively serving their um, obligations or who, who have uh, moved into an alumni status but still at a National Service Corps site. That's it from my end. I know that was uh, pretty long. I tried to cover it, all the bases as best I could and I hope it was at least um, uh, informative and uh, at, at least piqued your curiosity to find out more and I'm ready to take any questions if you have any and if I can't answer them I commit to getting back to you um, in writing so thank you so very much for letting us be a part of this and um, go fight win National Service Corps I hope you guys are interested. Kim thank you so much that was great um, we have several questions coming in already and uh, listeners if you guys have more questions you can uh, submit those again into the question box and we'll get to them as time allows. Um, our first question is can you apply for NHSC scholarships more than once? Um, I would say you can so let's say you apply for one year and um, and you fulfilled that requirement and you say oh shucks I should have applied for another year um, you'll get a notice from the National Service Corps and you would be able to apply for um, for as a as a new applicant I don't I don't I recommend that you that you kind of figure out in the beginning what you think that you might be able to do in terms of your service obligation and you might sit back to yourself and say hmm, I'm gonna be this old when I graduate from school and I probably have a young family and I think I'll be able to commit to two or three years that sounds reasonable to me um, I really think it's worthwhile to think through that piece because by the time you're done with school and you complete your residency and you get into practice you know there's a span of time there um, especially for physicians and it, it's worthwhile giving some thought to that um, uh, before you get out. I, I would say so because it's easier to apply once and to you know have the program have you in our system and give you th that scholarship money. What happens to us because we're a federal program we are at the discretion of Congress to fund us and some years our funding levels are high and some years they're they're not and it changes administration to administration and it changes as Congress changes so the years in which we get more money you know we've got a lot to go around and the years in which you know our budget is pretty tight we don't so I, I would just say for you for that person who asked that question it would help to be thoughtful and apply once and and here's the here I'm sorry the, I might have Great, I have a little bit second Go piece ahead. to that question. If you applied as a scholar the first time and you weren't able to get funded because it's a really competitive program and let's say you did apply and you did think through how many years of service and you didn't make it, you we would definitely encourage you to apply again. So if you if you tried and you couldn't get it, try try again. Great, thanks. Um, our second question, uh, this person asks, I was wondering if there's any chance that optometry and audiology would be added to the NHSC as professions. Um, so those, you know, types of medical degrees that are not MD or DO. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we get that question asked a lot and the answer is we are constantly looking at the makeup of disciplines in the program and the, the simple answer and the, and, and and um, is that this is a supply and demand um, it is about supply and demand so our sites who recruit our providers really drive the need and if the sites aren't recruiting ophthalmologists or audiologists it wouldn't make any sense for us to have applicants in that category because they would graduate as a scholar and be facing the government with a service obligation and nobody would be hiring and I'm just I'm giving a very extreme example but we look at that quite often and it really is our sites that drive the the demand and um, help us determine 
what disciplines uh, we offer at any given time. Um, the 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 more you know, again, we 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 do look at it often, and we do have uh, different groups that come in and and you know want to be part of the program. So that, in a nutshell, is is the the key driver, and we want our providers. Um, to be able to be recruited successfully so they can serve their service obligations uh, and we want our sites to, we really need to meet the demands of the sites and the uh, professional shortages of areas across the nation. So, yeah. Yeah, great, that's helpful. Um, our next question says, how many scholarships do you give out? Sure, um, let's see, I have that number and it changes. Um, I'm just looking for a point of reference. It changes. Um, I'll give you a little bit of. Uh, in 2013, we uh, we had uh, we gave 196 scholarship out, scholarships, and uh, we made uh, over 4,500 loan repayment awards. And in 14, again, recall the scholarship program is still open. We are predicting to make about 185 scholarship awards this year and about 4,210 loan repayment awards. We're still processing um, the loan repayment awards because we're still in 14 and the scholarship program is still open, so um, that's roughly the numbers. Just under 200 scholarships and uh, more than 4,000 loan repayment awards. Those are just uh, th those aren't just for MDs and DOs though. That includes the whole um, the whole host of disciplines that are supported by the core: dental, uh, nurse practitioner, physician assistants. I, I can I can get the MD DO number. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Okay. If uh, the person who asked that question, if you have any more specifics that you want to ask, you can add that as well, um, and we can follow up with you if, as needed. Um, our next question says: If I'm a current medical student interested in primary care. Um, but not sure of the actual specialty yet, would it be more beneficial to apply for the scholar program or the student to service program? Uh, scholarship program because you have more years um, to get through school and to, and to determine what specialty that uh, you, want, you want to pursue as a residency. The, um, the, the S2S program would have you in your last year of medical school and you'd be facing uh, a match and that would be upon you very quickly. So I would say the scholarship program would be the right one for you. Um, our fifth question, are there ever any shortages of sites for people interested in working in urban underserved areas, especially in big metropolitan cities? And we haven't, I, I've been here for four years helping to administer this program and that has not been an issue. No, we have, um, like I said, over 14,000 active sites uh, that uh, at any given time are looking to, you know, fill, uh, short, fill their uh, recruitment needs. And uh, we consistently hear from our sites that physicians are one of the harder um, disciplines to recruit and they take a long time. So uh, MDs and DOs are in high demand and they're very easy to, uh, to place and uh, recruit. Great. Um, our next question, how many applicants are accepted into the scholarship program and what percentage of those applicants, what percentages of applicants are accepted? Um, that's a that's a um, okay. So it's a little different from the earlier question. Um, I can tell you right now, um, the, the, for FY13, uh, we again 14 is still open, so I can't give you what the 14 picture looks like. Um, but for 13, last year we received about 1,700, uh, 1,739 applications and 196 were awarded. So you can see it's very competitive. Um, again, when our budget changes and we have more money in the program to administer, those numbers go up. So in 2011, we had more budget uh, dollars because of health reform monies that flowed into the program and we were able to make more than 230 scholarships. So it, it does, our budget does impact outcomes. But I hope that gives a picture. So um, seven, 1,740 applications, uh, just under 200 awarded. Great. 
Let's see, our next question. Um, this person asks, do providers working in NHSC sites generally get paid a lower salary than average? Um, in, from what we see, we, are, we have requirements for our sites, and I don't have them in front of me, but there was a slide there that referenced um, the site requirements, and we do re require our sites to pay a competitive salary. We don't dictate to them what that is, but we do require them to pay a, um, a you know a, a competitive salary. Uh, so I would say the answer is no, um, uh, it, it, as our, our requirements for our sites outline. Okay, great. Let's see. How competitive is the application process for PAs? Um, that's a good question. I don't have um, the PAs. Uh, when we let me go back to that. Let me try to find that. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can still see the slides, but I'm trying to go back to that pie chart that I had. Um, I can get the numbers of the PAs that oops of the PAs that have applied in 13, um, and uh, it looks like uh, for our PAs they're about 13 percent. Of, of the primary care providers in, in the core. So um, I do think, I mean, it's all competitive. I have to tell you, we always receive um, more applications than we can fund. Um, and I would have to get down, drill down a little bit deeper into the, the PA numbers in order to really answer that. I just don't have it off the top of my head. But I would like to give that person a written response. So if he or she is OK with providing an email address, I'd like to get back to them on that. We do have the email addresses of um, everyone who signed up and uh, and submitted the questions, so we'll be able to get that to you for follow-up. Okay. Um, our next question, if we are interested in the scholarship program, um, are we permitted to take a break, uh, to a break year, for example, between year three and four to do an MA program, for example, Master's in Public Health, um, and would an MPH be covered by the scholarship if we are in a dual, deg dual degree program, like an MD-MPH program? Okay, I'm going to try to answer that, um, but I'm going to need a little, give me a second because I need to figure out the dual degrees. Um, I do not think, um, I, hang on one second, I'm going to get that answer. I don't have it off the top of my head. I just want to make sure I'm going to give, okay, let's see. Um, uh, during, during uh, I'm going to go a long bout way. During the final year of medical school, the, the, the NHSC does approve postgraduate training programs, and I know you're asking about a break year. Um, I don't think that, that, I think you might be allowed to do that, but the NHSC won't pay for that break year. So if you're applying uh, to the scholarship program, you would apply for two years of, of, of your, of, of, paying for your educational loans, and then you would have a two-year service agreement afterwards. Um, and I'm trying to figure out if it's in the application guidance, because I do think that we have a Q&A around that, um, but it's not fresh on the top of my head. So again, um, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that, yes, you can do that, but the National Service Corps won't pay for it. So you have to be strategic in your application about applying for you know, year one and two having a two-year service obligation, doing that break, taking it, coming back, getting your residency, getting licensed, and then committing to that two years of service. There was a part two to that question. The first one was, can I take a break? And the second part, part was dual degree, right? I think, I think you covered it. Was, was would it pay for it? Yeah, that was the second part Yeah. Um, of the question. Uh, our next question says, how many NHSC scholarships are available this year for dental students? Um, and maybe to piggyback off of that, do you have a specific ratio uh, of different degrees, like within the scholarship program, or um, how do you decide, you know, how many physicians, how many um, dentists, et cetera, um, are awarded scholarships? Yeah, we don't have uh, those uh, those set asides for specific disciplines. Really, what it comes down to is that you are evaluated on uh, on on several uh, different criteria, and um, it it does require us looking at your GPA. It does require us looking at uh, at uh, at your educational uh, at your educational loans. 
it does require us looking at uh, the essays we ask you to write, your recommendations. I said GPA. Um, so we're looking for somebody that can excel and maintain good academic standing while in school and also someone who has a commitment to a career in primary care and working in an underserved community and the, how they demonstrate that commitment and that would be in the form of your essay your response to the essay questions that help us in our review and your recommendation letters and certainly if you have any prior work in underserved areas did you volunteer what are you doing uh, in, in terms of, uh, of, of your level of effort and then that's sort of the that's the the um, the what what are we looking for in the program and the selection factors and then we have what are called funding priorities and we do take a look at funding priorities um, our current um, uh, scholars uh, who want to stay and are eligible for support and um, for uh, students that have uh, recipients of federal scholarship for students of exceptional financial need and there are definitions in the back of those guidances that say what does that mean what is a a student of exceptional financial need and what is it to be somebody from a disadvantaged background um, and how do I prove that I am or am not and um, so we do take a look at that whole package but again a commitment to serving in an underserved area how you answer your essay questions your GPA your recommendation your academic performance you know all play and that then those 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 funding priorities I hope that helps to answer. I think that um, is very early on in the application uh, guidance document. I think you can find that in the first 10 pages. It talks about um, so how do you evaluate candidates that apply to the program and uh, what, 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 did, what does that mean and then in the back of the document it will give um, definitions for disadvantaged background and students of exceptional financial need etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Great, and that, that actually answers uh, part of the next question. This question is, um, what would make someone more competitive for the scholarship program? And, and maybe if you could address the second, what is one thing that can set apart an applicant from the rest? Oh, I think I've covered it, really. I mean, we have independent review teams that go through the applications and give them a score. And, um, you know, they're done independently uh, for, you know, program integrity purposes, but they are being evaluated on those criteria that I outlined. And I, you know, again, if you have a compelling background that shows that, you know, you are a person that is committed to serving in an underserved community, whether it be rural or urban, and your track record of doing that um, with a very strong GPA, with um, exceptional letters of recommendation, I think you are in, uh, you'll be very competitive in the program. And again, it, depending on the funding levels, if you don't make it the first time you apply, I wouldn't say it's a wash. I would keep applying. Great, thanks. Our next question, do you have to serve in the state where you are going to school or doing your residency? Um, let's say I go to school in one state and shooting to do my residency in a different one, what would be the best course of actions to apply for the student to service um, and for the scholarship program? The answer is no, but in order to fulfill your service obligation, you have to have a license from the state in which you'll practice. So let's say you're going to school in California and you want to do your um, residency and you want to serve your obligation in New York you're going to have to be licensed and and, and, and uh, passing the exams in New York and any other laws that apply to that state, um, uh, any other requirements for you to become an MD or DO in that state um, in order to practice there. That's, so the answer is n no. You can, you can go to school in one area and practice in another. Great. Okay, our next question, is there a lot of need for nurse practitioners? Yeah, I mean, we we do. We have, um, there's, I can't even quantify the need. The need is across the country, and, you know, our nurses are in such high demand. Um, I, I would love to come back and talk to you guys about a whole other set of programs that we administer, uh, but you can find them online if you, go, if you Google nurse core loan repayment and nurse core scholarship. 
and they are programs that are also administered by our agency um, in addition to the National Service Corps programs that I outlined today uh, that recruit um, nurses. And so yes, our nurses are in high demand and um, uh, I think it's also a national trend. I think nurses across the country have been in high demand and will continue to be. Um, they have different uh, laws and different states about you know how they can practice and where they can practice so that you know that that would be up to the individual but the long and short of it is yeah we've got a demand all the all the disciplines that you see in the core are in high demand great um, the next question for the scholarship program upon graduation do you work at sites that are only that 14 plus level or at any level uh, that's a really good question. Yeah, every year for our scholarship program, we uh, calculate uh, a a, a uh, baseline HIPSA score, and it is a calculation that takes into account um, the need across the country and how many providers are in, in the country, et cetera, et cetera. It has consistently, for the past two three years, remained at a HIPSA HIPSA score of 16. So very close to the 14 level in the loan repayment program, but our scholars who come out and are licensed and ready to serve would be placed in a HIPSA of 16 or higher. Very good question. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks for addressing that. The, the, I, I'm sorry. Second part to that, HIPSA scores of 16 can be urban or rural. So again, our placement team takes into account where you'd like to be, what your top choices are, and really works hard with you to, you know, get you interviews at at, at sites that, you know, are, are meet uh, meet uh, your needs and what you're looking for. So you, I guess the way to look at it is that we take retention very seriously. We want you to be happy and love the community that you're in. So you'll never ever leave. And um, retention is a big deal to us. We put put a lot of investment into our providers. And it's important to our sites and our communities that they stay. So our placement team really takes a look at that and says, let's try to place our scholars in a in a place where they'll be happy as you know an employment opportunity for as long as they want to be there. Um, so they, they really work hard on that endeavor. And uh, just to add to that, I, I know you've mentioned to me, and you can correct me if I have the statistic wrong, but it was something like 85% of of people who have served stay for longer than their um, the required amount of time is that, is yeah. that right? yeah thank you Christy yeah they do um, we have such a high retention rate um, I guess we're very lucky in that regard and we our sites work hard to um, you know help our providers stay but we have an 85 per percent retention rate which is, is exceptionally high and we're always talking about retention and what that looks like and um, sites are sharing best practices of what it means to keep a provider happy and um, uh, and fulfilled in a career in a site um, so yes the, we do have a high retention rate and we do uh, encourage our sites uh, and our providers to uh, you know find an employment match for uh, as as long as they can it's just like any place else if, if you really don't like where you're working you're gonna vote with your feet and leave and so um, you know your your ability to find a place that is very fulfilling to you is important to us great yeah this is our this will be our last question for this evening um, when is the best time to apply for the scholarship program is it the year um, when the student is applying to school or once uh, the one in which we have acceptance or the year they'll be enrolling? Uh, let's see. Um, to be considered, I think this is the question, and, and if I don't answer it correctly, please let me know and I'm, I'm happy to respond in writing. But to be considered for the scholarship uh, award for the 2014-15 school year, so this year, the the, the, scholar, the the student must begin their classes on or before September 30th of 2014. So I hope that answers the questions. So um, uh, if, if they're planning to be on any leave of absence that precludes them from a full-time uh, student at, and attending classes full-time, or if they won't be able to be in classes on or before September 30th of 2014, they should wait and apply to the next year. I okay. hope that 
makes sense. I and think if, that answers. And just just to confirm my understanding, so if if a student is say an undergrad right now, um, but has been accepted, will be enrolling in medical school before that date this fall, they can they can go ahead and apply now for the scholarship program. Yes, that's true. Okay. Yes, yes. I, I think that's what was being asked there. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, great. Thank you so much for, for presenting to us and for answering all those questions. Um, I know we do have a few more, and we'll follow up um, with you on those um, and provide contact info, uh, as you requested throughout, for some of those other questions. Um, yeah, to thank all of our you. listeners, thanks for joining. Um, uh, when the, serv or when the uh, webinar is over, we will have a quick um, survey that will pop up on your screen. and. Um, if you would fill that out for us, it's really short. It would help us a lot. We want to uh, continually improve our webinar offerings, so we would appreciate your feedback. Um, and with that, Kim, again, thank you, and thank you to your team, and have a great evening. Thank you so much. Loved being a part of this.